right, welcome back to biology. This is 6.5. We're going to be talking about adaptation and coevolution. We've been talking about how a species evolves. We look at things like changing phenotype. Um, I guess the phenotype, shoot, what's the right word for this? Gradients, like the bell curves that we talked about, or how you can have a single gene and change percentage of alleles, stuff like that. We learned how to calculate the allele frequencies based on knowing how many of the how the percent of the population that's homozygous recessive. Now we're going to start looking at how species interact with other species. Um, and also some different patterns in evolution. How do species tend to evolve? So, first definition of terms. Adaptation. An adaptation, um, this is the verb adaptation. We've already talked about the noun adaptation. For As a noun, adaptation, an adaptation is a behavior or physical characteristic of a species that helps it survive or reproduce. It makes it a better fit for its environment. As a verb, the process of adaptation, um, adaptation means to process, um, adaptation means by how, the method by which evolution changes a species to become better suited to its environment. And so the species adapts over time. I don't know if that's a verb or just a different form of a noun. I'm going to have to think about grammar. I don't like thinking about grammar. But let's move on. Okay. This is compared to acclimation. Adaptation is permanent, or at least pseudo-permanent. It's a long-term change in the entire species. Acclimation is a short-term change in a single organism. Um, it's a learned response. Acclimation is something that they learn to do. If you teach your dog to sit, that's acclimation. They do it to get a treat. Or um, birds that identify a new food source and they start eating the berries off a fruit tree you just planted in your backyard. That's also acclimation. Um, adaptation is an evolutionary change that we pass down from one generation to the next. Okay, moving on. And yeah, I don't know why I can't get this into presentation. I just didn't want to do it today. Um, adaptive traits, then, are the characteristics that assist with survival and reproduction. This can be new traits that you gain, like changes in beak size and shape here and these finches. Um, can be physical or behavioral. Things like bird songs and stuff like that are adaptive traits. Um, and then the new structures that we see are usually alterations of the old ones. Uh, for example, um, if we look at reptiles versus mammals, uh, a mammal's jawbone, that lower part of your mouth, you know, your jaw, is made out of one single bone. In reptiles, that's made out of three or four different bones that are hinged together, and that gives them much greater ability to, like, open their mouths crazy wide compared to, like, mammals. But in mammals, we took those same little bones, and we evolved to use them as part of our ears. There are the three bones of our inner ear um, that allow us to hear better. And so mammals, as a rule, have better hearing compared to reptiles because we have a more highly evolved hearing organ. But we use part of our jawbone to make the ears. Um, same thing with the, the gills and stuff like that. Very early in fetal development, mammals have gills. Um, but those gill structures become the arteries coming out of the heart and along your collarbones and stuff like that, they all got adapted to different purposes. If we look at like bones of legs and forearms, um, you can see how the bones of an arm, of like a, a human arm or a dog or a cat arm, became the bones in a, in a bat's wing. It's still got the upper arm bone, it's got two lower arm bones, um, it's still got five-fold paws, you know, five fingers, um, just different shapes, same bones. Okay, moving on. So this can also be a, a loss. Vestigial organs are the ones that we still have, but they've lost function. Um, usually they've also become much smaller in shape and size as they're being sort of selected against. Um, in humans, this includes things like our wisdom teeth. Humans still have wisdom teeth, but they don't have a purpose anymore, and a lot of times they cause problems, and so we get them extracted. Um, in whales, uh, whales don't have any hind limbs at all, but they actually still have a tiny little whale pelvis bone. Um, it's not attached to anything anymore. It's not even attached to their spine. It doesn't really have a function. It's just still sort of there. Um, sometimes you see snakes. There are certain snake species that have legs, like tiny little, little rudimentary legs. Um, in dogs, they still have their dew claws. That's basically a toe that got stranded as the, the shape of the dog's paw changed. The toe got stuck up higher up on its wrist bones, higher up on the leg, um, and it's just sort of hanging out there. It doesn't touch the ground. It doesn't have a function. Sometimes veterinarians will remove them because sometimes they get caught on things. Um, so these are all vestigial structures. And then what we call that, um, when, when one thing gets sort of adapted for another job, we call that an exception. These characteristics that are adapted for one purpose becoming useful for a different purpose. I already talked about the jaw bones becoming our inner ear bones. So that would be an exception. Um, there's also some enzymes. This can happen at the molecular level too. Enzymes that are used for glycolysis that have sort of a different characteristics of being transparent or clear. 
which doesn't matter for glycolysis. Breaking down sugars doesn't depend on where the light is, but it was very useful in the lens of the eye. And so some of these enzymes that do two different jobs, they're part of the lens of your eye because they're clear, but they're also still used in every single cell for glycolysis because that breaking down sugar part is super important as well. And so we see the same protein with different functions because they happen to have two characteristics that are very different from one another, but useful in different ways. Okay. So that's all about adaptations. Number two, convergent evolution. This is a pattern in evolution where we see similar characteristics in species that ended up with similar lifestyles. Um, so environmental pressures, because they're a lifestyle, push these distantly related organisms to end up with similar structures or appearances. The example here most commonly is sharks and dolphins. Um, they're both hairless, they both have large uh, fins at the back, um, pleated snouts, stuff like that, but they're not closely related at all. Sharks are fish and dolphins are mammals. Um, here, this diagram sort of shows that shark characteristics versus dolphin characteristics. They got the fin on the back, they got the two fins in front up with swimming, and one rear fin, but they're not closely related species at all. Same thing with the ichthyosaur, which is now extinct. Um, that was actually a reptile, but again, they, they have the same lifestyle. They live in water, they're predatory, they, they're fast hunters, or can be pack hunters, stuff like that, and that ended up with similar body shapes. We also see this a lot when we compare um, mammals to marsupials in Australia. Australia was cut off from the rest of the world um, millions of years ago, and so as the rest of the world's mammals sort of developed away, away from marsupials, Australia stayed with marsupials, and the marsupials filled up a lot of the roles that are taken by a lot of other mammals. And so, like, we have a, a mole here in Kansas. If you guys have seen moles or heard of moles. But there's also a marsupial mole in Australia. Um, there's a marsupial mouse compared to our regular mouse. Um, there's marsupial monkey-type things, the spotted couscous, similar to lemurs. Um, they have flying phalangers, which are similar to flying squirrels. Um, even predators. There was Tasmanian tigers. This one's a Tasmanian tiger cat. Um, that's similar to a bobcat in terms of its predatory nature. Um, and then there's Tasmanian moles, which are similar to wolf wolves. Um, but they're not at all closely related to these. All marsupials are more closely related to one another than to any of the mammals. And same thing with the mammals. Uh, a wolf is more closely related to a horse than it is related to a Tasmanian wolf. But because they have similar lifestyles, they end up with similar sort of body shapes and behavioral patterns. Okay, so that's convergent evolution. Um, another example, when we look at flight, uh, flight is very demanding in terms of what kind of body shapes can fly, and so we see similar things with the bats, with the flying lizards that are now extinct, uh, and even birds. They have things like hollow bones, um, very rapid digestion, high metabolic needs, all that sorts of stuff, even though they're not closely related to one another. Okay. Then we have coevolution. Convergent evolution, the two species don't even have to interact with one another, they don't even have to live in similar close to one another, they just have to have that similar lifespan, they can be on opposite sides of the planet. Coevolution is when two species actually do live close together, and so they interact with one another, and they sort of direct each other's evolution. Um, two species that cooperate with one another and influence each other's adaptations. Um, cooperation might not be the right word here, because it's not always a peaceful, happy relationship. Um, there's sort of an arms race, for example, between predators and prey. If the lions get faster, the gazelles have to get faster. The survivor gazelles will be faster because only the fast ones escape the lions. And then if lions want to eat the gazelles, they have to get faster as well. And it drives the, uh, the competitional drive evolution towards the sort of the maximums capable of their body plans. Um, there's also mimicry. Um, some species look like other species to ward off predators. Like uh, you might have seen, um, oh, like bee flies. There are flies that look a lot like bees. Uh, you can tell the difference because they have the enormous fly eyeballs, but other than that, they're striped like bees because things tend to leave bees alone. Or it helps them find food. They use mimicry as a lure, um, like the angler fish from the abyss. You know, they have that bright light in front. That's that's um, They're mimicking a um, bioluminescent organism like a worm or something like that in order to lure and prey. There's symbiosis, which we talked about a lot in our ecology unit, about dependence between cooperative organisms like algae and fungus and lichen. Sometimes this can develop to a point where they're utterly dependent on one another and they've lost or evolved adaptations to uh, and that they need each other and can't live without each other anymore. And basically everything on Earth has co-evolved. No species on this planet has evolved just by itself. We've co-evolved with reference to our food sources around us, the things that have hunted us, um, the plants and animals that we live with, I mean, it's coevolution is just the driving force behind all evolution, really. There's nothing that's just been by itself. 
And here we see like a mongoose and a snake in this image. Um, snakes are, the, they got this sort of backwards. It looks like the mongoose is throwing poison at the snake, but it went the other way around. Snakes are venomous. Mongoose has actually evolved a lot of resistance to snake venom. And so a mongoose that gets bitten by a snake isn't as much risk as something else that gets bitten by a snake. Okay, one more slide. This is just sort of showing the different types of relationships. And we already talked about this a lot in our evolution um, section about predators versus prey, par parasites and hosts, mutualism where they both benefit, or competitors where they're both driving each other away. And then down here, um, mimicry is a huge part of, of nature. There's a lot of mimicry that goes on. Um, so this is the Society of Insect Mimics. And it says, it has come to my attention that not all of us are what we appear to be. One of us is a plant. Like, they're all mimicking plants, but one of them is actually a plant, and it's the, the Venus flytrap back here in the back. And I just totally explained the joke like a weirdo. But anyway, have a great day. Don't forget to do the worksheet. I'll see you guys next time.